This is day three of the August 93 seven-day retreat at Springwater. The talk yesterday on fear brought a lot of further comments, questions, and discussion, as well as some misunderstandings. So we will spend more time on that. One misunderstanding was that I was heard to say that all thought creates fear. Are you saying, the questioner went, that all thought creates fear? Obviously, that was not what I meant to say. Maybe I did say it, we'd have to go over the tape, but it's not a question of what was said then. We can look at it now. Does all thought create fear? Of course not. Thinking, thinking right now of walking through a grassy meadow, the fragrance of flowers and wet earth, humming of the insects, maybe a deer passing across. The open sky and so forth. That's not fearful, is it? It can be a, a deep joy Wanting to have pleasurable thoughts is a very common occurrence, isn't it? Thinking and deriving pleasure from thinking, from fantasizing, agreeable or ple pleasant scenes, evoking memories of pleasant events. But it is the same thinking process which produces pleasurable feelings that produces fearful and anxious feelings and emotions in the body. It's that same process that can produce anger, convert on the instant a rather peacefully balanced body into angry upheaval. The thought of what he or she did to me, the unfairness of it all the meanness and so forth. The more we talk, the more loaded the words, the angrier we become. It's the same thought process that when thinking of a peaceful scene, a peaceful moment in the past can produce those feelings. Or if one, one's house has ever been hit by lightning, or one has had traumatic experiences with loud sounds like been being through war with bombing attacks, even the rumbling of a thunder may directly or potentially trigger apprehension, fear. The whole connection isn't conscious yet, but the feeling is already there at the sound of a loud airplane flying overhead or a a thunder crashing. The other question that came up for several people was, is fear only created through thought? And with that, the conviction that not only thought creates fear. I, I mentioned it during the talk, that in us there is a resistance to blame thought for feelings, emotions, feelings of existence 
which seems so real, so actual and concrete. And there is a resistance to hearing someone say, thought created that. And you may remember that in using the word thought yesterday, I said, let's use it generously to cover what is inextricably connected and linked with thought, which is sensations and feelings and emotions and memories, verbal as well as nonverbal. A tiny baby has experiences which create memory traces, which when evoked through associated present stimuli will bring about a fearful response. It is memory that connects what happened in the past to what is perceived now through the connection with that memory. Our perception is impacted. It is distorted. We don't see clearly now. As long as memory is feeding our perceptions or affecting our perceptions unconsciously, without attention given without awareness. And then, of course, the, the question, aren't there real fearful uh, situations right now have nothing to do with memory? I see a car coming, just turning right toward me. I didn't expect it. Aren't I afraid? Isn't my running a sign of fear? That is, again, a matter of language, what words we use to describe something that happens when a truck comes barreling toward me faster than I expected. Or driving in a car, a car suddenly pulling out in front. One can notice something is triggered internally, which brings a heightened attention, often an energy of sometimes tremendous uh, Niagara of anger about this so-and-so pulling out in front of me. But very often, and we did include that in our discussion yesterday, very often a crisis or emergency which triggers these chemicals which, that contribute to heightened awareness and energy to deal directly with the situation are not even experienced as fear. say there's real danger. Real danger is per perceived quite clearly in, a, in an emergency due to this uh, tremendous energy that is being mobilized. Maybe the need uh, to survive which is programmed in every cell of this body disconnects unnecessary or, or dis distracting thoughts and just sees and acts appropriately, accurately. So, do we call that fear? Staying away from a precipice at the Grand Canyon, not going too close. Is that fear? Or is that also a, a useful application of knowledge that the stuff may crumble and may crash and not come out alive. This is, this is where memory performs a very useful function. If it is clear and factual, not just obsessive, obsessively running. Somebody wrote, wrote me a note here, which fits into this context. Yesterday, while walking outside, I saw a snake. Almost simultaneously, there was intense arousal and focus of attention. And the recognition that it was a harmless grass snake that was crawling away from me. There was heightened sense of perception 
chills, and then a feeling of pleasure and awe of having seen that snake. Is this fear? If we attempt to use language to describe things and then that we can communicate about and share in our communication. Maybe we can agree, for the time being, not to call that fear. Actually, the description, before the question comes up, is that fear, the description is so alive and, and, and correct, and uh, we can all see what happened. We don't have to stamp another label on it. Now this is this, and put it into the box of fear. Why do that? What we were talking about yesterday is imagined danger. Of the memory of painful, hurtful, past situations which when associated with a present imp input of any kind, the, the brain can associ them, associate the most unconnected, logically unconnected things. If at the time of experience this great hurt, a telephone post was in the vicinity, the seeing of a telephone post can arouse fear because in the past it was visually connected and associated with a traumatic, painful experience. And to become frightened at the sight of a telephone pole, this is what we call fear. Fear of being hurt some, somewhere than that. This is a, the example is where nothing is available of what, what really may be dangerous. And that's what happens to us often. We say, I don't know why I'm afraid of this, but I'm afraid. And being afraid refers to these, this, this state of the organism, which we described in quite a bit of detail yesterday, the physical symptoms, which mobilize the body to either run away or fight, fight back or paralyze to, to not be seen, to, to be as dead, which, which animals have used to great advantage already long before human beings evolved. After the talk, it occurred to me that I hadn't mentioned one fear which is so universal, so timeless, which is the fear of dying, fear of death. didn't think of it during the talk. It came up indirectly yesterday in a discussion where someone mentioned the close connection between past hurt and fear, having himself seen, come up from memory one time, a, a scene of having been punished by the parents severely, ter getting terribly hurt, and the fear of this hurt lingering not only lingering unconsciously in the memory, but also constructing a behavior, an image of oneself, to protect against that hurt. Maybe becoming, I don't remember the precise thing that was said, but becoming the tough one, the brave one, or the good one, the good obedient child that will not be punished by the parents. So 
the hurt and the fear of the repetition of past hurt has contributed in human beings to behavior, to behavior patterns, to guard and protect against reoccurrence of the hurt. So a lot of behavior that we display or manifest today in which others may find objectionable or reject or others reject or like for that matter it is clung to so tenaciously as me because it guards and protects against or that is the assumption of the organism that it protects against reoccurrence of past hurt that one will not be punished again, not be ostracized, put into the room. Or rejected. That then came up in the discussion. Is it the fear of rejection that so permeates our behavior today by trying to be good or trying to make friends or being devastated if we're criticized because we're rejected the way we were rejected once when we could hardly survive it. Because for a small child, everything must still, everything of surviving must be felt instinctually to depend on the goodwill and care and presence of the caring adult. And when that is severed, even for a brief periods of time, there must be some fear of dying, not existing, being annihilated, not surviving, whichever way. It may not even be verbalized at that time, but programmed into this organism as we can all feel and witness time and time again is a, a drive, a desire, a need for survival. And then all of our actions, all our inventions, technology to ensure our survival. And one of those tools is our behavior, our self-image of being tough. I have two nephews had a very, very punitive and easily rejecting violent father who forbade both boys ever to have toy guns because there was this ambivalence in himself about his own violence which was not acknowledged and seen. So the boys could have no guns in any form and yet experienced a lot of violence at the hand of the father punish punitive rejection particularly the one the younger one both of them as soon as they were of age joined one joined the marines the other joined the air force and both of them have collections of guns <laughs> particularly the younger one, we were very close, we were very close with both boys, they were like our children. The younger one was so afraid, I remember whenever he would be a little bit hurt, he'd roll in the grass and cry. And his mother was quite solicitous, particularly of the younger one. He always made a big fuss injury to him, it was much more than the scratch or the hurt sustain. And he was the one who joined the Marines and a few years ago ran for sheriff in his locality. So how can we not take our present behavior and imagery that goes with it 
what comes first, who knows? It's all inter intertwined. The idea of what we are and how we want others to see us and treat us. Not take it for granted, but become aware of it with a grain of salt. We usually don't have that grain of salt. We just insist on it. We want it to be accepted by others, not rejected. Because this is me. And if my behavior, my toughness or whatever, has developed as a consequence of fear of hurt, if that is questioned or criticized, I feel almost close to annihilation. So can we put a, an enormous internal question mark right through all of our ways of talking and behaving and making remarks and defending ourselves and attacking others? Not necessarily physically, but verbally critical. Critical of ourselves. All of that, begin to listen to it in a new way. Not to affirm it or have it being accepted or accepted ourselves, but to wonder about it. To have it be a light thing rather than this heavy crust which we defend as me and insist that it should be accepted by ourselves and others. It is not. We are rejected. Or at least we feel rejected a lot of the time, don't we? We don't get a job or we're told to leave the job. We're criticized on the job. Our husband, wife, or lover leaves us for someone else or at least prefers someone else to me. It starts in school. Children suffer immensely. starts, of course, much earlier at home. A brother rejecting a sister. The hurt goes so deep and is so preserved as something to, to either protect or pass on to someone else, to reject someone else. That, that for some reason gives us human beings' relief to do to someone else what is done to us. Can that come under consideration, under observation, when it happens so automatically, so unconsciously, to inflict hurt of rejection that we suffered or are suffering on someone else? And this strange sort of relief satisfaction that ensues for a short while? Can we question it, become aware of it first? How do we become aware of how we are and talk and defend? Maybe the time is when we do hurt. Because that is usually a moment of some sort of awakening out of numbness, maybe, or dullness. We hurt. Why do we hurt? What's hurting us? Who hurt us? Why? What is going on in ourselves? What are the thoughts and feelings? I've been rejected. Or I think I have been rejected. I may be wrong. Someone who said something critical to me may not have rejected me at all, just wanted to say something that was bothersome or irritating. And I feel rejected and already have a strategy coming up to reject him or make him feel how it feels to me, rather than looking at what's happening, looking at what the person said. Is there something in what she said or he said? Can I look at what I do? Usually, I don't, there's sort of like an electrical fence around that. Buzzing. Don't look. Because 
This was brought out quite well yesterday in the group meeting. That self-image is already a protective device to not hurt again. So with looking at my present behavior, my present image, the defense of it, the pain of being rejected, to look at that, I must be ready to feel pain. Maybe an old pain, an old ancient hurt that was never felt since this protective behavior evolved. That was able to squish that pain, repress it, we say. So, in this work of this moment, is there a readiness to feel pain and hurt? And if that readiness is there, then we are also able to look at how we are, how we behave, how we react, and maybe even extend the awareness to include how did this other person feel about me when he said what he did? What may I have projected or, or said or done that may have hurt him or her? So that all of a sudden, we are many, not just ourselves, which we are. Because these processes that unfold in attention in oneself, of defending and image building and hurt and rejection and paying back to others what we receive that operates for all human beings. We are always watching everyone and watching ourselves. And with a deepened understanding of ourselves comes a deepened understanding of others. And with a deepened understanding of others and ourselves may come the awakening of compassion, taking the place of fault-finding and blame and rejection. So if in hurting now, I'm really interested in opening up the whole thing, even if it's a Pandora's box, letting it all come out. And observing it at times, we'll lose it. We, we get involved in the anger or in the pain or in the fear in the story of it. And there'll be more emoting. But this is the strange and amazing miracle of human life is that we do wake up to what's happening right now. Sometimes for the briefest of moments. And usually it's immediately landslided with thoughts and ideas of what we should do about it or how we should be or should not be how others shouldn't have been or should have been. But we do wake up again. And at one moment of waking up, can we just stop, look and listen to what's there and allow it to unfold? Like these beautiful movies, slow motion of a, a flower unfolding and another petal and another petal and another and another and there's something deep inside. Deep inside may be this primal elemental fear of not being. which, if it is put into words, has already a fearful sound, doesn't it? And yet, our being, most of the time, is a being of fear, 
and all its accompanying physical discomfort and protective behavior with which we run into each other and rub each other wrong, to put it mildly. So in, in really feeling the hurt and pain now without protection, seeing the protective images come up and just seeing them, not taking action, because awareness has its own amazing action, which is not thought-based. It comes out of the total situation of now, out of total nowness, let's put it that way, comes the action of awareness. And that action of awareness may just be stillness to see unfolding what's there. The hurt, the fear of not being anything. That was the primal pain when our parents rejected us or punished us. Fear of not surviving this. And the amazing fact that all of that pain and rejection and hurt of the present moment when not defended or hidden or, or hidden is entirely survivable in a more healthy way than we've ever lived before. Not contorted, not conflicted, not tensed to avoid or to pretend, to avoid being something or pretend we are something else. That is the amazing right action of awareness. Unfolding all the wrinkles with all the thoughts and pains and, and remembrances that drop out of it and feel it all, see it all, but not identify with it because it is the human situation that is unfolding and felt. Not just mine, not just poor me. <laughs> Someone could say, where is the energy for all of that? Usually I just have enough energy when I'm hurt to get myself away and distract myself with something to help change my thoughts or get over the hurt. I don't know where the energy comes from to look and listen. It does come Just think of it. it. Or it can come when we get together and talk about it. Not just in a superficial way, banding together against somebody else who did something and you and I agree this was bad, so I get support. I don't mean that kind of energy. I mean getting together, the rejecter and the rejected, to look at it, to open it up as a common problem. Can we do that? Because we may not want to open up because we're afraid the person will be hurt and then he'll, he or she will be harder to get along with. So I better not say it because I want to have to deal with a hurt person in addition to a rejecting person, you know. This is how thought can run. So can we create some time? We're always trying to do it here on staff to create time where we can talk to open things up, but often the time for that disappears again. There is something we resist in this, or we have too much business to talk about, so that there's no time to come to these essential things which ultimately support the business in a healthy way.
Or we may say, oh, there are just too many meetings. And just saying that rejects meetings. Whereas when we are in a meeting and we do meet, we really meet and probe and look together and listen to each other. And all of a sudden there is this energy that we usually don't have. It is generated by people coming together to look deeply and question deeply what concerns not just this group but all of humanity. Our incredible difficulty in getting along and understanding ourselves and each other and out of misunderstanding perpetually hurt each other and defend against each other and attack each other. So can we make time not just to sit alone, which is of deep significance, because I may not need you to come clear about the pain of rejection and the defense and all of that just melt away in a, in a new state of being. We talked about it yesterday, in which there's the, the, ro- the beauty of the rolling thunder and the gentle wind, the echo and the birds, quite still now. Not as an escape, but this is what is going on right now, as well as the breathing of 45 people and their heartbeats and blood circulation and listening and feeling. To be in touch with that, you don't necessarily need someone else to talk about. It, it comes on its own. a listening mind, body, but to, to deal with our conditioning, to unveil it, to, to probe it, to understand it, expose it. We need each other. Well, you could say, I, I can understand my conditioning, how defensive I am. But Don't we need to communicate about it together? Because we are each other's problem. And maybe each other's solution. By working together on this in a new way. In which maybe slowly identification with me and mine gives way to just looking at human beings, like you and me. But looking here, because this represents, this human being represents everyone else, has all the processes there, potential or actual. And if today's meeting didn't go well, which it happens so often when one gets together and the great discontent afterwards, we had no closure on anything, all these loose threads, what's the use of these meetings? I won't go to the next one. That's a mistake. So it's possible to meet again and again and again and again. Bringing our discontent with meetings, looking at that. Anything, anything can be, start, can be the starting point for human beings to get together and wonder and inquire, using oneself as the sample. Because this is where we can look the closest, albeit very often 
in a very yet distorted way. But these distortions can fall off. The vision become clearer. The less there is the need to defend because we're all looking at the same thing, namely ourselves. This just came up with a question, where does the energy come from? Few people have said that to me over the years already in this retreat. Isn't it amazing when even two people come along, come together, all of a sudden there's such energy to look and listen. don't need explanations, the facts speak for themselves. So where are we right now? We will end here for today.